Welcome to the Mime Radio Show. I'm Karen Hoyer. And I'm James Donlan. And the man behind the curtain in that black frame around us is Michael Diaz, our engineer, producer, glue man, uh, fix it all. He's the one that pulls the buttons or pushes the buttons, pulls the levers. And uh, we're so grateful to him. Today, we have a wonderful guest from uh, Serbia, which uh, is in that very interesting part of the world east of italy you know and uh, i think it's a a land and a region that mo most of us should try to get to at some point it has a long history it's the center of civilization or close to at least so let me read you about marco stojanovic who is the co-founder and president of the world mime organization as well as a performer an actor a teacher a manager uh, a, a really wonderful uh, man with an amazing career. Marko Stojanovic is co-founder and president of the World Mime Organization, devoted to creating a global network, promoting and establishing mime as a mainstream art form. The WMO endeavors to educate people of all ages about the craft, rich history, cultural relevance, and social impact of world mime. In his native Serbia, Marco has played leading roles in numerous TV series, sitcoms, and TV films. And I say numerous, if you look at his CV, on regional, national, and satellite broadcasts throughout the, the, the whole country. He has acted in theater throughout Europe and appeared at many international festivals like Edinburgh, Avignon, and Stuttgart. Marco has received many national awards for acting in comedy and for contributing to the cultural development of children in his country. He is the 2021 winner of the Golden Badge Award of the Cultural and Educational Association of Serbia for selfless, dedicated, and longstanding work and creative contribution to the spread of culture. In his own words, quote, I work with many people of different backgrounds, cultures, abilities, and disabilities, such as hearing impaired children and children with cancer. So let's welcome Marco Stojanovic. Ta da. <laughs> so there he glad is. to have you here, Marco, all the way from Serbia. Belgrade, wow. right? Belgrade, Belgrade. How do you, Belgrade. you guys Belgrade. Pr pronounce it in Serbia? What would be the uh, accent? Pardon? Belgrade. Belgrade. Ah. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Means white city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. White yeah. city. Yeah, that's interesting because uh, Chicago in the time of the Columbian Exposition World's Fair was called the White City because it was a beautiful creation of architecturally white buildings. Well, I get I think that Chicago is the second largest Serbian city in the world. Is that true? Uh, we have a huge uh, uh, there's a huge Serbian population in, in Chicago. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. Well, yeah, we oh. should um, do a one of the world conferences in the World Mime Organization oh, yeah. conferences would, in Chicago. That would be yeah. wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was so, a couple of years ago. I, I had a show. I played for for Serbian community there. Oh, well, wow. the, not a couple of years ago. That was like maybe twelve years ago or so. Yeah, yeah, wow. fantastic. Yeah, we're really excited to hear about your life and your career and what you're doing now. And uh, thank you. So, um, I, I know of you mostly through these um, interviews that we've been doing on Facebook Live, which is how James and I got to know you. And I, I know that you've also done quite a few very funny comic videos and lots of film work and television work, but specifically for live performances, which, you know, lately we haven't had the chance to do those over the during the pandemic times. But 
putting yourself back to that moment right before you step onto stage, how do you prepare yourself? Do you have something that you say to yourself or something that you think to get ready to go on stage? Yeah, that moment, that little second before the lights come on and the public views you. Uh, well, I, I do something that I, that I was teaching my students also. I breathe in and go for it. So it's like, an, like you, need every, you need to have an impulse for everything that you're doing in your life. So that, that uh, a burst of energy to start something. And uh, uh, the simplest impulse is just breathe in and go. Yeah, and nice. So yeah. Yeah. Release of the energy. Yeah. What people usually do, they, they kind of, they have stage fear. I mean, all of us, we do it in, in on a larger or, or a smaller scale, but, but usually people do to relax. They go like, they breathe out, which is nice, but you cannot start anything when you breathe out. Plus your, your spine is not, uh, uh, and your back are not in the proper position. You have, so your muscles don't have the energy. Uh, you need oxygen to, to, uh, to digest sugar so that you would have immediate energy in your muscles. So you have to breathe in. So the best way is breathe in and go. Wow. <laughs> and and does, the, does the profile or the kind of audience in front of you like change that? ritual or is that constant depend or does it change with someone if it's no, kids don't. or that, that, yeah. that that's my personal so i mean they also expect the audience also expects to see the beginning to know where things start whether it is a, a lecture or a, or a, a show they need to know when things start and when things end so that's that's really important to know where when is the beginning and yeah, yeah. When is the end and possibly the applause at the end. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Marco, what is your relationship to the audience? Do you like to be able to see your audience? Do you oh, want yes. to? So do you have a direct connection during, like if you're performing a, a strict mime piece, do you connect yes. with the eyes of the audience? Yes, yes, I do. I like I like watching people in the eyes. And uh, I know that, that, that there are uh, teachers that teach you to not to look the audience in the eyes try to look above their heads or whatever uh but i like the eye contact and even if you have a person that is yawning in the audience that is sleeping or or playing with the phone nowadays <laughs> uh, yeah you know i always say that the eyes and the fingertips or the fingers or the hands are the extensions of your nervous system it's your brain yeah. you know so those eyes are so important that content it's almost like some kind of ethereal uh relationship you know with the eyes meeting is actually the nervous system oh, yeah. Meeting. And yeah. acting is communication so you have to communicate i mean yeah, you yeah. have to, to see what other person is thinking and how you are doing through their reaction so even uh, uh persons that that are uh, reacting like that like yawning or sleeping or uh, playing with the phone they are your friends because they're giving you a valuable information uh, uh that you're doing something that is boring so you have to change something. <laughs> thank you for that information uh, uh so yeah i like watching people in the eyes and i i was fortunate enough that uh, that during my career i did a lot of comedy and that's kind of a genre my genre genre where i feel at home uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I had, uh, I, I was improvising a lot, and people here know me as 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 uh, an actor who likes to improvise. Even in even in, I played in uh, Greece, for instance, the musical, uh, for like five years or so, almost a hundred shows, and even there I was improvising. Uh, uh, no, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, in a sense, the you know, someone who improvises, that's a very uh, quick and agile and developed brain. That's a person that can do that because you are connect. You can't improvise without being connected to the universe. So, you know, I think the audience appreciates improvisers and and feels the value of it, whether it's technical or not, because that is the meeting of the brains. The improviser can meet the brain of the audience. Who is that audience to you? Now, here's a question. So is, as, as a group, is the audience uh, a force to challenge, a force to embrace, a force to uh, defy or to, uh, you know, to like um, convince of something like what do you what, and what who is what is that out there that that life 
that energy of the audience, you know, in a, in a general sense to you? Well, that, that really depends first on the show and then also on, on the audience. It's never the same audience every, every night. So it's different. But the, the, the general thing that you have to establish to establish as an actor is trust because, because they, um, um, they, the audience comes to theater uh voluntarily asking you to make to perform to make to establish an illusion for them mm -hmm. and to be able to believe in that illusion you have to be open so they are vulnerable the audience is vulnerable so they have mm. to trust that you won't be hurting them in any way uh, uh so i guess that in first couple of minutes of a show that's the first thing that you do you establish the language uh, so that they know what genre it is, what kind of show, what kind of language will you be using in uh, 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 in your show, not only verbally, but also uh, non-verbally, et cetera, et cetera. And there is that moment of trust. And when you gain their, their trust, you can you can do whatever you want. You, you become for hour and a half or two hours, you become best friends and then you play as as if they came to your home. And what? I have a question. Yeah. Let me just ask this question. So now you live in you're you're Serbian. You live in a very, a very uh, diverse part of the world. You know, many different cultures are in this area where you live. And I'm just wondering, would the audiences in um, the former Yugoslavia, Serbia, you know, Croatia, and all these places, or Macedonia, Romania, would they have a particular wisdom because they've been exposed or been living in a different cultural melting pot is that something as opposed to maybe a country that is a little more homogeneous or an area that's a little more do you th have any thoughts on that well um uh yeah you can say that yes uh, i never thought of that but uh, uh uh i think that's not only here but i guess in eastern europe in general uh, first of all, uh, uh, our colleagues, uh, actors, directors, etc., they don't like the word entertainment because mm -hmm. that's kind of that's not art. Art is art, and entertainment is entertainment. Oh. Entertainment is commercial. That's that's capitalist thing. It's not our thing. Uh, <laughs> I don't agree with. I mean. I like the I like the term the art of entertainment because even if you watch the tragedy, it shouldn't be boring. It should entertain you. Even if it is something sad, you are there for the illusion, uh, uh, as I said a minute ago. Uh, and the, the the audience here was brought up in the same way. Uh, well, I guess the older audience, I could say. Uh, nowadays, kids that were brought up on internet, uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they don't have that kind of patience. They uh, they have a span of like thirty seconds to maybe up to three minutes of patience. Uh, and if you if you in that time span, if you're boring and not entertaining them in any way, pop, they will go away. So, <laughs> which is good. I mean, it's, it's great. It's great. I love that kind of relation. You know, you, you have, you know, immediately if it is, if you, what you're doing is good or not good, if you're relating to your audience or not. And but, as mimes, as mimes, the, the, the modern mime needs to understand that, I think, that the, the attention spans are possibly different, you know, and that's a challenge for the art of mime, I think, is, we can talk about later, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I have, want to go back to a little bit about what you talked about, the relationship with the audience and uh, forming that relationship of trust right at the beginning. Mm. How long did it take you to really articulate that, to figure that out, that that's exactly what's happening in that moment? Oh, I don't know. I've been doing, uh, I've been in, in, in uh, for professional acting uh, for like 31, 32 years now. I'm 50. So, and I started my studies. I, I actually went to the university earlier. I was accepted when I was like 16 and a half. Uh, so I got my bachelor's degree when I was 20. And I started acting professionally already during my studies when I was like 18 or so. Um, uh, it, it, I guess it took me 
30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I don't know. Uh, in the beginning, it, it was a game for me and it was fun. And I think that uh, as actors and uh, 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 mime artists or whatever that, I mean, we're all the same. We are actors, we are acting on stage with, with uh, voice or without voice, it doesn't really matter, with words or without. Uh, uh, um, you can't lose that part to have fun on stage and to to enjoy yourself and and to transfer that kind of positive energy to the audience. But it took me some time to understand that that kind of of friendship between between actors on stage and all the people that are making a show, not only actors mm. and and the audience. Yeah, it, I, I guess it took me 30 years. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, I just had a how, thought. Um, tell us how yeah, you began to choose to do mime and physical theater. After uh, studying acting and theater, how did you go along that path? Uh, I, I didn't choose. I was chosen. Ah. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, as I said, I, I, was, I was really young when I was accepted at, at the university, uh, when I passed the audition, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, um, and I had a professor, his name was Max Jankovic. Uh, he was a professor of stage movement. That's uh, a subject that we have during three years of studies. Uh, I think they have it now for four years. So our, bas our bachelor's degree is four years. Um, uh, uh, and he, he was keeping me after classes. When we had a, a, a class with him, uh, he was telling me like, hey, you kid, stay with me. I'll teach you a couple of movements uh, of mime. And I said, Phew. I mean, I was brought up to respect professors. And especially at those times, we didn't question anything, not like kids today. Kids today always ask why. You know, they always have that, <laughs> that uh, uh, a question from hell. Why? You know, do this. <laughs> why? No, just do it. I mean, do it. <laughs> uh, we'll find out why maybe later or yeah. in a few. Uh, so we were, at that time we, we had that kind of respect for professors. You don't ask why, you just do. So so I was staying after classes and and uh, he was teaching me mime. So he probably saw something that I didn't. I was very physical always. When I was a kid, I was very clumsy, very clumsy. My my parents even took me to a, to a doctor to see why really? was. I Falling over. We had in Libya. We had like three steps to go up to 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 our house and three steps going down. And I was falling all the time, up and down, up and down, falling all the time. So they took me to a doctor, and he told them. <laughs> so I have an official uh, uh, doctor's. Uh, how do you say that? Um, a diagnosis. Uh, yes, that diagnosis. Yes, exactly. That uh, I'm clumsy. So he told my parents. <laughs> that was the official uh, diagnosis. Uh, your boy is clumsy. Yeah, your boy is just clumsy. Everything Send him to the circus. <laughs> but physical, you know, when I was, uh, uh, and, and very loud, um, I, I liked uh, films. And we, we um, uh, in 1976 or 7, they, there, there was a film crew that came to, uh, to Libya to film um, um, uh, the Desert Lion, uh, a film about one Libyan uh, hero, uh, and uh, and uh, actually that was a producer of Halloween, the whole series of uh, the film Halloween, mm -hmm. and and the director. So uh, the film was with uh, Irena Papas and Anthony Queen, uh, uh, and we lived in the in the same area, so we we became friends. And my father was very into uh, technical stuff. Uh, he he was very he liked uh, music and uh, sound equipment, and uh, we had all sorts of stuff at home to listen to really good music. Uh, uh, but then we saw the first umatic umatic video player. Whoa, you know umatic tapes that those, those are like uh, one inch uh, uh, wide tapes. Yes. Uh -huh. But and he wanted to buy it to buy it, uh, but then after like a month or so, uh, um, uh, the producer of, of Halloween, I forgot his name. Um, uh, I'll find it. Um, he bought the first VHS video recorder. Wow! 
<laughs> so we bought that from him together with like <laughs> so and i was watching films all day long um and nothing else to do uh the school uh, i i went to serbian school well yugoslav school at that time which was like 20, 250 kilometers 150 miles away from where i was living so i, I was homeschooled uh, so I was watching films, those 20 tapes. So we had like The Wild Bunch on wow. tape, had the, um, 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 uh, uh, we had Party with Peter Sellers. We had the uh, Flying Machines. That was a funny film. Um, so film really influenced you quite a bit. I mean, your sense oh, yes, of, yes. of so, drama yeah. and comedy. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then I was, I started reacting scenes from those films at home. And later on, I loved to go to cinema. I was going, I, I even, well, I, I think my record was like six films in one day in cinema. Wow. Oh my cinema. goodness. Did you ever uh, re, re, uh, redo the, the choreographed uh, massacre in or the wild bunch of the Mexican army <laughs> falling? Did you ever, as a kid, I used to do that. One of my specialties was, was uh, standing on my bed and uh, conducting the national anthem. And then uh, I would get assassinated at the end. I'd get shot and I'd do a slow motion death off my bed when I was about oh, 10 years old, you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> Later on, when I came, came back to Belgrade, I was 10. Uh, I, I started going to cinema and the, the, that was 1980. So the films with Bruce Lee were very popular. Hmm. <laughs> and I have a younger and I have a younger sister hmm. <laughs> with whom you would be practicing uh, Bruce Lee movements. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, those were fun times, yeah. Marco, um, did you you studied with Marceau in his school? Did that come yeah. after college? Yes, yes. Uh, I went there in 1991. Couple, just a couple of days after after I received my diploma here and from the University of Arts in Belgrade. So this was before you had started your acting career. I know all the work you've done in in regular uh, films and acting. And was this? Did you study with Marceau before that period? Before yes, you really got your yes. acting career going? Yes and no. I already started acting when I was when I was uh, studying, uh, like on my after my second year. Um, it, it that was not unusual and it is not unusual so people from theater come to see your the directors and producers and uh, managers of theaters because all of the theaters here are repertory theaters and especially at that time all of those theaters were uh, 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 owned by the government whether city government or or uh, or state government so and received all all their budget from, from could, could a young could a young actor be placed in one of these rep I know in some yes, countries yes, you yes. know like Czech Republic the graduates are placed in these repertory theaters in the nation that's what was happening at that time also so they they came to to see our exams to and then they started picking uh, uh, young actors for small roles couple of words here couple of words there you know then bigger roles etc cetera, etc cetera. so I before I ended my studies I already had like four or five professional shows and uh, I think three or four uh, awards on, on some festivals here uh, in, in, uh, in Yugoslavia at that time. So I already kind of started my career and uh, there was um, a very avant-garde theater, which is still kind of avant-garde. Uh, 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 it's called the Atelier uh, 212 because it had 212 seats when it started. Now it has a whole building with <laughs> much more seats. Wow. So, um, what, so what made you want to go to study mime with Marceau? And tell us a little bit about what that experience was like being in the school. How long were you there? What kinds of things did you do? Yeah, I, I was there for a year. Uh, Marceau, his, his origins are also from Eastern Europe. So he kind of watched at us from Eastern Europe with um, in, in kind of a mild and friendly way and, and understood the, 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 some, some of the hardships of, of life in Eastern Europe. So uh, he, to a couple of us, like 
four or five of us from Eastern Europe, he gave the first year for free. So we didn't pay the school, which was wonderful. Um, um, uh, and uh, but I, I went there uh, by chance. I, I did. Um, I, ha I have a good friend with whom I studied and we were kind of a um, uh, comic duo on, on uh, uh, during our studies. So people were coming to watch what we prepared for our exams and not only for exams of acting and theater, but also, which is unusual, they came to see our exams of stage movement and ballet, et cetera, et cetera, because uh, the, the 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 word spread out that we were funny and that we do some unusual things and that <laughs> so people started coming to 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 see us and we did a parody on sports we call it bloody sports so that that was a parody on sports kind of a, the videos that you saw about curling that that's on on the same same style so uh, like clown esque uh mimish everything without words we were also using our voices to produce all the all the uh sound uh yes yeah stuff. and, and uh, who was that partner and did you go to school together yes rade markovic rade markovic a good friend he also writes now very well for television uh a wonderful actor and a comedian uh, so we did a show where uh, people heard about bloody sports and then um, they told uh, uh, one of our very famous uh, theater directors who was um, uh, a selector of shows for the uh, International Monodrama and Mime Festival in Belgrade. And he came to see us and he said, okay, so this 15 minutes, can you make it longer, like half an hour, 35 minutes for the festival? So we did it and we opened the festival in 1991. And then after the show, it was very funny and it was even uh, recorded and broadcasted on television. Um, um, a professor from the university came and she said, well, I didn't know that you were interested in mime. And she was working with our government, helping them with uh, international cultural and educational uh, cooperation, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, well, I have a prospect, uh, a brochure from Marcel Marceau School in Paris in my, uh, in my uh, office. Uh, would you be interested to go to Marcel Marcel School? And I said, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> it was wow. an accident, really. Uh, and I went and passed the, the audition and stayed there for a year. Well, was, was, there a, was there a wide international profile of the students? Was, was, were they mostly from Europe at that time or were they from all over the world? Well, from all over the world. Uh, yeah. We had, uh, uh, on my year, we had the, uh, a good friend of mine, Offer Bloom from Israel, with whom uh, uh, I started the World Mime Organization and the World Mime Day Initiative. Um, we are still very good friends. We vi visit each other when there is no Corona. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, we had the guy from Japan, Naoki Imuro. We had uh, a bunch of, of course, of French people, Spain, um uh, uh united states Wes uh, wesley brainard he actually was accepted with us but he came a, a year later to study um what did you uh, take away from that experience uh, what, uh, when Bulgaria, you uh, czech republic uh south america chile i think Qu quite yeah from from different countries what did you take uh, after this year what did you take away did it influence you uh greatly yes. or like what like to this day like how did when you look back how has that time influenced you and what what were the, the lessons that you may have learned about yourself you know yeah. the most important thing is that it kind of opened my eyes to movement in general so since then i was working with really different people and not only people in theater but also in dance uh, show dance hip-hop etc etc with uh, um, uh, deaf children. I developed also some 20 years ago a program, uh, a training for public speaking and public appearance and nonverbal communication, etc., for politicians, managers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I really worked with different different people, and even with people that with when I worked with people that are doing something that doing a movement that I do not know. So. 
in, in, in a field that I'm uh, not an expert in, even then I knew what their movement lacked or what, what their movement was lacking or what, what, how to bring them to do something and to do better, even though, as I said, I, I, well, I did not know the technique or, or, or whatever else. So it really opened my eyes to movement in general. I could understand movement and I, can, I, could, I could bring people to do, um, uh, to do the movement properly with proper energy, to, with proper motivation. Sounds like it really that the important thing that, that I learned there. It sounds like it really helped you develop your eye for your your ability to see what needs to be um, edited or changed or developed. Yes. How do you how do you um like you're such a man of uh, such so many facets and sides and this thing we were discussing before we went on the air that you're you know you're really about communication and you know the the movement aspect the gestural aspect is emphasized but how would you define your art or what you do how you know if someone at a party asks you what you do what would you say to them <laughs> 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 uh, well when 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 the people interview me here in media they always ask me how how do I want them to sign me on, on, on screen? And I say always, just say actor and, and that's it. Because I think that a lot of things are in that word, in that term actor, because you act, so which means that you do. So uh, uh, mm. I'm not that much of a philosopher or, or you know- Really? <laughs> So, because I learned to do, and and, uh, and if you don't do, uh, nobody yeah. can see it. So it's kind of making making things out of nothing. And uh, on the other hand, I like to... oh, sorry, what? can you hear that? Do you hear that music? Ah, it's a little bit of music to tell you there's a gift for you. <laughs> However, the gift never arrived. Oh, uh, yeah, unfortunately. Uh, okay. I have to tell you what the gift is. Eventually, you will get it. It's a mime microphone. Because, oh. because we know that you, as the head of the World Mime Organization, are responsible for a lot of talking. Yes, exactly. You see, you've already got one, right? <laughs> Yeah, you can so, add it to your collection. Yeah. So our um, we have a mime museum where we uh, have a, a huge collection of mime artifacts, and yours actually is that mime microphone that you thought you were going to need, but it turned out. <laughs> so this is just sort of a way to sort of segue into te you telling us about the World Mime Organization and what's what's your goal with that, and and where is that going? Yeah, it's so very interesting because you're you know you're talking about all these different facets of communication, and yet you're the founder of the World Mime Organization. So, how does mime, in its 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 uh, classic sense and in its uh, elusive modern sense or transitory sense, how does how does that fit in your brain, Marco's brain, to establish the World Mime Organization and fit with all the other things you you do? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was always trying not uh, uh, not to not not to have a boring life. And, <laughs> uh, I always had different. Interests. Are you saying mimes are fun? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> should know this. Everybody should know this. But mimes are fun. Yes. Yes, yes they are, and especially well, maybe not while they're working, but. <laughs> uh, not all the time. Sometimes they can be also very, very nervous. But uh, yeah, they take it too seriously. Sometimes, you know, they yeah, take it. Uh, Minds yeah. are fun. Minds are fun. And uh, uh, the idea with the World Mime Organization was well, Offer Bloom. I brought him here in 1998 to to Serbia for a small tour, and we we, we even played together 
uh, we had a, a charity event for uh, children ill of cancer and we played together in one night he played his show and after him i played my show uh uh and all the uh, the money that we raised on box office went to the children's ward of uh, mm. uh, national cancer research center here in belgrade um and um uh, at that time so that was 1998 we spoke about it for the first time we said well i mean internet was already there uh in very kind of especially here in very uh, moving in and baby steps, you know, so uh, we were browsing, well, we tried uh, to browse a little bit the internet that, to see if there is an organization uh, dealing with MIME and we found out that there isn't a World MIME organization or so we said, well, we should do something about it, we should try to make it and, and try to bring our, at, at first our friends with whom we were uh, studying at Marcel Marceau School, keep in touch and bring people together. And so nothing really special and uh, make mimes talk to each other. Um, uh, especially because what, what I found out, I didn't know that really. I, 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 didn't, I didn't have that experience or, or knowledge, but what I found out that uh, in Marcel Marceau schools that everybody is a soloist, you know, it's kind of mime is a solo art and it isn't. Yeah, in the basement. We're in the basement, you know, in the lonely street corner, whatever, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and later on, what I found out also through trying to do some co-productions and cooperation with uh, with colleagues and art, et cetera, is that everybody is trying to keep that one square meter of uh, pavement uh, of streets where they are performing and not let not let anybody in. Ah. You know? And uh, I, I, I was brought up in theater where everything is a team effort. Right. So I never, no, I never did a monodrama. In my 30 years of experience, I never did a monodrama. I did a stand-up comedy show once in 2006 or seven. I even toured Canada and the United States for, for Serbian, Serbian people there living there. But I never did a monodrama, which here, for instance, in Serbia and in Eastern Europe is quite unusual. So, so I was just a second, Marco, when when you say monodrama, that's yeah. not a word that we use, but is is specifically solo, a solo, performance. solo one person show. Yeah, yeah, solo it's program. a great word. I like it. Yeah. yeah. So I never did it. I mean, as I said, it's quite unusual in uh, in in Serbia and in Eastern Europe. Actors do it, especially if they, they don't have work. They, they do that and they can tour or they choose a piece which has to do something with, for instance, with, uh, um, with lessons of literature and language uh, in schools so they can tour schools, et cetera, et cetera. I never did it. So for me, that was an unusual, uh, 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 unusual um, uh, knowledge that I got from, from Marcel Marcel School that everybody was trying to do solo solo mime parts and I didn't understand why why they don't do anything together like with two three people or five people on stage I understand that it's expensive and it takes time and it takes effort production wise etc but but well it was unusual for me so mm -hmm. from that logic I, I I I spoke to offer and said well we have to do something about it I mean uh, especially with mime, which is such an international language, with uh, you know, with with uh, at that time uh, uh, internet slowing, uh, slowly coming uh, into our lives, uh, 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 we can communicate in in uh, without large ex phone expenses, you know, phone bills, etc. Mm -hmm. But through internet, etc. And we said we have to do something about it. We have to make people cooperate and uh, and um, tour. Even then. That was 1998. We were talking, sitting in in my living room and 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 um, drinking coffee uh, <laughs> or tea uh, or akia. <laughs> but uh, 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 and we were talking. What if he would be in in Israel and I would be here on stage and we would have 
ICQ was uh, a, a, a chat app at that time. Mm -hmm. ICQ. I don't know if it, still, if it still exists. And if if he would be there and I would be here, and if we would have uh, uh, screens to see each other and cameras, but mm. if we put all of that together in real time in virtual space so that you would see a stage performance, but not on a real stage, but in virtual space, and so that we would have an audience like in ancient Greece, like 30,000 people, or maybe even half a million people, and everybody <laughs> dollars to see us. So that would be sounds, perfect. It sounds very much like this past uh, year and a half of pandemic times, where Zoom theater and the ability yeah. to Zoom with each other became something that was so necessary for us to stay alive as yeah. artists. But and it's, we it's about that in 1998. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what? How has the um, from that first chrysalis of idea in 1998 to now? How has the world modernization? How the have the goals changed? I, I'm, I'm sure the profile well, and the membership has changed. But well, what's the membership? Yes, yeah, but the goals. No, the the main goal is to make people talk to each other, to make uh, uh, my artists talk to talk to each other and see what happens. Uh, some of them will visit each other and have a coffee. Uh, some of them will maybe do a show together. Uh, one will help help another tour in their in his country or her country her, her country. So and it is happening. We established it officially in 2004 uh, here in Belgrade. Uh, we wanted to do it in Israel, but it was uh, it was less complicated and much cheaper to do it here in Serbia. So our laws are quite liberal uh, in the field of, of non-governmental organizations. And so we did it here. Um, and in the first couple of years, it was mostly a local thing. Uh, I used it here to, to do some of, of, of the work that I was doing with uh, deaf children, et cetera, et cetera. But then we said, okay, we, we have to do something with it. It's there. Nobody had the same, probably had the same idea, but nobody did anything about it in, uh, elsewhere in the world. So around 2010, yeah, something like that, we decided to revive it and mm -hmm. to reestablish it, but properly in, in, uh, in, um, internet, on an international level. And we started the work. And then it was much easier because we already had emails and uh, websites, right. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it slowly grew. Now we have members. We don't have a, uh, uh, like thousands of members, but we have 200 and something members from five continents. So we last year we had our first member from Australia. We didn't have members from Australia for a very long time, but last year we, we had a, our first member from Australia. And... The year before that, uh, first member from Africa. So most of our members are from Europe and uh, and uh, Northern America. You know what I especially like is not only the, this you on this Mind Radio show and even the idea of the Mind Radio show is a product, you know, a byproduct of the World Mind Organization because your me meeting you through the World Mind Organization has spurred these ideas. But one thing I like particularly about the World Mind Organization is your the thought that. You know, we all know the, the idea of mimes talking to each other. We all know there are very specific techniques and schools of thought in mime. And some of the people are very protective of each of those areas. But I particularly like the mime world organization's a philosophy that every technique counts. One is no better than the other. And everybody has a, has a place. And if we could establish this idea of sharing and not valuing one particular style or profile any more than another... I think that would that's a fantastic thought to pursue, you know. And Marco, Marco, talk a little bit about the festivals that you've worked on because my growing up that was the way that mimes communicated. There were many festivals and when I just too, yeah. left um college. Not as many now, but the festival is is like an automatic um meeting place for different artists it's a stew it's a soup it's like the it's a wonderful soup with all the ingredients the yeah. savory ingredients yeah well 
what what we did a few, uh, in 2018, we established for the first time, we did the first World Mind Conference here in Belgrade. And the second one was in 2019 with the idea exactly of that, people meeting, talking to each other. Um, uh, uh, Offer wanted to make it more fest more like a festival, more like presentation of works, et cetera, et cetera, and, and shows. But I was more into go going into the serious part, like any other conference, like a science conference or, or, or any other conference where you have people, where you have lectures, et cetera, et cetera. So that we would show that my, uh, even, even among, among us to show that my artists and artists in general are not just enter especially my artists are not street entertainers. Uh, and because mine became, well, it's actually, it kind of came back to its Greek roots uh, to, to, to street, street art and street entertainment. But we wanted to show that mine should be taken seriously. My artists are doing wonderful work. It's not easy work. Uh, I mean, when, when you uh, uh, take out the voice or at least the words uh, uh, from somebody, it's not easy to express themselves only with their bodies and their faces and, and, and their muscles. And, you know, it's just not easy. Uh, yeah, it is not the easy. The first language that we spoke, all of us, uh, mm -hmm. and I and I guess that because it's in our nature is to tell stories, so we're all storytellers. Humans are storytellers, so I guess that the first storytellers were minds, uh, 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 and we wanted to talk about that, and we wanted to bring people together, and all all of us experience that uh, there are Marsois. <laughs> and the Kruists, and, uh, Grotos, and the, whatever other is like Martians, you know, but, and, and Venus, Venetians, and you know, it's right. kind of like like we 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 all of us were enclosed in 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 techniques like like almost like sects, you know, like yeah. you sects, and you go like oh Marceau and oh the <laughs> But it's not, we have to cooperate. And the main thing is we want to produce a good show and a, and a great experience for our audience. And it doesn't really matter what technique you're using. You're using the technique that you know and that you feel comfortable with. And Marcel Marceau was doing what he knew and what he was comfortable with. And the crew, which, who was his teacher, was doing the same and they were experimenting and everybody is doing the same, all of us. Uh, Do you find any resistance today with some of the practitioners to this thought? Is there any, to, or is that breaking down somewhat? To be very honest, I was surprised that there was no quarrels and uh, no fights. Uh, during <laughs> and everybody accepted that. And I, I guess they were, they looked relieved. When, when they accepted that idea, they really looked relieved because mm. suddenly they believe, started believing in themselves and what they are doing. I mean, it's like any other product. I mean, there's an orange juice and a uh, hundred factories are producing orange juice, but you prefer an orange juice from one factory. I prefer from another factory. So it's a matter of taste. It's a matter of what my body uh, is and uh, my inner self is uh, uh, feeling well with and what what is good for me what i think is good for me it so, sounds it sounds like uh, your one of your main goals then right at the beginning was that the art of mime would be taken seriously yes. as as a, a specific art form do you yes. feel like that is evolving and happening yes and i'm really happy about it and i think people are really happy also our members First, they started communicating, um, and that's really important. Second, uh, after our first World Mime conference, some of them were traveling, and they rang up a person that they met in Belgrade, and they had a coffee, and they were taking pictures, selfies, and they were sending me selfies. So th that really made me happy. Uh, and uh, the third thing is, I think that um, 
uh, I really do not want to take any credit for it, nor the World Mime Organization. Uh, maybe it's because we started communicating, so we have now the information about what people are doing around the world. But I, it looks as if uh, kind of um, general self-esteem of mime artists in general. Uh, not that's a good point. That's a very good point. The courage uh, is coming out. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, and, I, 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 you know, hearing you talk, I want to work in your office. Sorry? Hearing you talk, hearing you talk, I want to work in your office somewhere, some world headquarters of the World Mime Organization, you because, and that's, it says that's exactly the the feeling that I think one should feel when they talk to you or talk to uh, someone with these goals, because mm -hmm. you're talking about the secrets to, you know, I've, there's this quote, I think you've heard me say it before, but I, I, I found it from Marceau in 1960. He says, an art dies for the lack of creators and the lack of schools. And schools should be serious. You know, it's a, it's a regimen of discipline that needs to be, you know, studied for a period of time. And, um, you know, the survival of art, it's, of culture and art itself re requires creators and schools and education, which is serious. So, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your teaching and, and, and how you go about teaching what you do, specifically um, working with mime and using mime in your teaching? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, uh, about teaching in general and, and schools in general, I, I want, uh, I'm very passionate about that, so I'd like to touch that topic. Um, 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 I'm very pro formal education. Me too. Very pro. <laughs> so with formal diplomas, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it uh. it wouldn't be there if it wasn't important. Uh, and on the other hand, the answer why, because kids today always ask why, I always tell them. I always tell my students. Uh, they don't like this and they don't, they don't like that. And they think that this can be better taught. And, they, and why don't we te learn this and we learn that? And so I said, you're right. And they're right. But what school gives you, school gives you a safety net. So in three years or four years of, 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 uh, of uh, university education, you get a safety net. So you can learn one technique, maybe. You can, you can touch three, four, five, six, ten other techniques. Touch them, experience them a little bit. Fine. And the most important thing, you can learn how to research and how to teach yourself. Mm -hmm. And with that one technique that you learn, that's your safety net. Mm -hmm. So Marcel Marceau's technique, fine, very well, I know it. When I don't know what to do, when I'm, when I'm trying to work on a show and I try to do things and I research and I try to experiment and I try to find some new things, some my technique, my new language, something new, you know, you, you are um, motivated and, and uh, inspired and, and full of energy and you do it, but then you pow, you get to a wall and you don't know what to do. And every, we all have that moments when we don't know what to do and how to do it. But then you have a safety net. You go back to the basics, to the technique that you'd learned at school. So mm -hmm. then you start from the beginning and you do it that way. So that way the production is not in danger because you'll come out on time. You are not in danger because if nothing else, uh, what you do on stage will be okay. Mm -hmm. And it's most, it's really important if you're, especially if you're doing a show with other people, you have to be on a certain level. You don't have to be the best, but you cannot, uh, um, you cannot, you have to be uh, a good support for the others too. So right. it's not all about you. It's about, about the show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it kind of it, Eastern Europe still, well, now we're really, really hardly influenced by, by, by American culture and Anglo-Saxon culture, which is very narcissistic culture. It's all about me, me, me. It's not about the, the, the sorry, I'm sorry. It's not about the you know, team and, and group, etc. 
uh, but it's, it, it's really important to do the show and to do it properly. So we are all experimenting, but we have a safety net. So we have, we can, we can have the courage to do it because we know that we won't be uh, falling down on our flat on our faces, but we have a safety net. And that's yeah. what gives you in, in three or four years. And that's perfect. That's enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's enough. And, and, and where, how do you do your teaching? Do, are you a part of a university or do you do d teaching in-, in I, I was, I was like three years ago, I was, uh, I stopped teaching officially at the university. I, were, I, uh, uh, I am an associate professor. I think that's, that's like a, just a level yeah, yeah. below the full professor uh -huh. uh, at the university. A lot of mimes only become associate professors because the acad academic people are mystified and intimidated somewhat by mimes. And so they never, sometimes, in, at least in our university system, they, they never allow them into the upper palace very often, you know, because the mimes well, are still fools and the mimes point out the, the political and social uh, yeah. problems within the system. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's why we have to fight for it. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's why I would really love that our conference becomes also a conference where you can gather because as a professor you have to to write uh, papers and to go to conferences but those conferences have to be recognized by the ministry of education so that you can gather some points etc cetera, etc cetera, because for that you for your phd thesis and blah 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 so i want our conference to that's why i would like our conference to be that serious so that well i think you know the connection with the uh, what's the group uh god my mind is slipping the the world theater organization that um uh, the international have, theater. yeah talk talk briefly about that relationship that's developed between yeah well in 2000 i wrote uh, uh we wrote a, a letter of uh inviting other organ organizations to cooperate and we send it to a couple of international organizations uh, uh, in, in the world. And uh, we got a response immediately from the International Theatre Institute, with, which operates within uh, UNESCO, uh, which is wonderful. And uh, in 2017, we became global partners. Uh, so now we are, we are partners. Uh, and since last year or so, uh, we, on our initiative, from the, on the initiative of the World Mime Organization, we started, for now it's called the working group, but hopefully it will become a committee, which means more serious. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I miss uh, that committee. <laughs> for the uh, a working group for physical theater. So, and this is the first time uh, the International Theater Institute has working groups and committees and sections for all sorts of theaters, for musical, for monodrama, for uh, uh, writers, etc. but never had a, um, a, a group dealing with, uh, with physical theater. So we established that now as an interorganizational working group. Between yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, really, that's really wonderful. What, do, what are your goals for that? How is that going to play out? Well, we still don't <clears throat> We know it's again all about communication and all about uh, exchange of knowledge and experience between mm -hmm. uh, between people that are dealing with physical theater in general. So it's not only mine. So it's physical theater in general, uh, not dance. But nowadays, I think that uh, we are always trying to put things in folders and files. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 but nowadays, I think that really those boundaries between contemporary dance and physical theater and uh, mime and there is also dance theater and people tell me that <laughs> physical theater and nonverbal theater are not the same thing so uh, it's kind yeah. of confusing uh, because um, I think that that theater in general in the world now is in a new era of exploration not yeah. only of all the technology that we have nowadays but but people are always talking about avant-garde theater and avant-garde this and avant-garde that and i believe that the, that avant-garde is something that well, happened it's because so interesting the word so i think that right now we are in the research theater is in general in the research of the new avant-garde it's so interesting because you're saying this because mime 
to, to, to do mime, let's call it mime in general, but the mime is what the writer, the very often the writer, the creator, the director, the philosopher, the politician, the dancer, the clown, the ac the acrobat, the athlete, the, you know, the poet, um, you know, there's so, like you said, we were saying earlier, mime is difficult to do because there's all these influences and all these worlds of ingredients that come into creating the mime show right mm. and that is a, a very you know a large plate but you, like you say the world might be ready to embrace that kind of because we are everything is coming together you know in terms of yeah. so and mime is the art of the synthesis of all these elements of theater and 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 literature and you know it, it's it's an it's an amazing art form that really almost it's like a, a modern art form it's a timeless art form. I mean, that's pretty much if you look at what we're talking about now. I think also that's the reason why these conversations that James and I are having with different mimes around the world, I think that's why it's so interesting is because they're not just performers, they're they're creator performers. So they have this sort of goal about what they're- uh, what, hey. You hear some- It's getting hot, hot. it's getting hot. Put it out, put it out, put it out. Feel the, feel the heat. Oh. Oh. oh, it's getting worse. Oh, it's getting hot. hot. Oh, it's that time. It's rapid fire time. You, you feel the heat, Marco? You Are you feel ready? The heat? The heat's you ready for come. a game? Yes. <laughs> the heat is going to come to you in a moment. So we're going we're gonna to play a game. This probably will take you back to your comedy shows or whatever. And this is called rapid fire and what it is is i'm going to give you a word and you're going to do an association either physically or uh um um verbally all right we're going to do two rounds because we have audio listeners and we have visual platforms where these okay. this interview will appear so we're going to do two rounds the first one to get you warmed up well maybe you can choose uh, so this list I'm going to read to you, you're going to respond either physically with a short gesture huh? or you, you can respond verbally. So now we want to do it consistently with each round. So which one would you like to do verbal first or physical first? Mm, let's do physical first. OK, I had a hunch that might be the case. All right. So uh, enough yeah. room to move. Yeah, you can do anything you want, but it's physical. <laughs> round number one of rapid fire, ladies and gentlemen, on the Mime Radio Show. There we go. Oh, he's taking his coat off. He's getting yeah, ready. Yeah. He's an athlete. He knows. <laughs> okay, first word. Spotlight. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Hands. Eyes. <laughs> Fourth wall. <laughs> <laughs> Sweat, sweat. <laughs> Child. <laughs> Elder. Uh, reminds me of one of our guests we had a few shows ago. <laughs> <laughs> Props. Props. <laughs> Mask. Mask. <laughs> Age. <laughs> Failure. <laughs> Elephant laugh. <laughs> Critic. <laughs> Teacher. <laughs> Corrupted innocence. <laughs> Fame. <laughs> 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 
language. <laughs> Mime. Oh, I love it. I love it. Future. Ladies and gentlemen, that was round one of Rapid Fire. Beautiful. Wow. That was fantastic. Bravo, Marco. Bravo, bravo. Very good. That's uh, that's, that's going to go in the highlight film, you know, when we do the, the, the documentary about Mime Radio Show. Okay, this round two. This is yes. verbal reaction to the phrases, okay? Mm -hmm. Quick as you can. Laser leaf. What's a laser leaf? Good. Spotlight. Ah! <laughs> Hands. <laughs> Eyes. <laughs> Sweat. <laughs> Very good. Child. Oh, hello. <laughs> Elder. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> Props. <laughs> Mask. <laughs> Velvet Sun. Age. Uh, uh, nah. <laughs> Failure. Oops. <laughs> Critic. <laughs> no. Moving faster now. Teacher. Fame. Fame. <sighs> Language. Me only. <laughs> Would you repeat that, please? I love that. Fame. Uh, look at me only. <laughs> Language. <laughs> Future. <laughs> and finally, suspended sneeze. <laughs> thank you very much ladies and gentlemen that was round two of rapid fire bravo marco bravo marco this all those wonderful sound effects remind me of the videos that i've been watching of you um there's a, a series that were called mr comedy and yes. the, some that were about curling and there they remind me of like a silent film because they're kind of speeded up but the sound effects that you put with them the gibberish and the um, the reactions, uh, they're, they're great fun to watch too. And I, I hope that we can put a link to them uh, so that people can see those videos. How did, how, how did all of those videos come about? Well, Com uh, uh, Addy actually was a, um, uh, uh, a game that, uh, that I did on television uh, every Saturday in one uh, variety program on Serbian national television, that was in 1997 or eight or so. Um, and I had like my five minutes. And at that time, uh, well, no, it was 1997 maybe. So uh, uh, the audience had to see what I was doing uh, on television and then they had to buy a newspaper and then cut out a, uh, uh, a small uh, uh, coupon where they would write the answer and then send it to the TV station and maybe win an award. Um, <laughs> nowadays, you do all of that on your phone you know, or, <laughs> or over internet, but that was then. So I did that for a couple of months and uh, I kept some of the tapes. So then later on, when YouTube came, I, I edited a couple of those and I named them I, I experimented to see what kind of 
um, uh, personage, what kind of a, uh, a person I can play and how can I name it. So I named it comedy. Uh, mm -hmm. I just played with it. You know, and it's later, interesting. The, and the uh, other one, what the other one was uh, like a trio of performers, and it had to do with your your curling yes. Um, champions, right? Yes. Yes. Well, it was with uh, with my uh, assistant at that time, Boyan Miatovic, who also is an actor. But I actually, uh, well, in two thousand and six. Uh, we went to Canada to play curling for the first time for 10 days. We practiced curling and right after that, a couple of days after that, in December, we went, so that was November, in December, we went for the, our first European championships. So uh, I organized because we didn't have any money. Uh, at that time, I was playing a, a children's show in one really famous children's theater here in Belgrade. And uh, I already knew people in Canada that were organizing shows for, for Serbian community because I, the year before I was there with another political satire uh, group uh, and show that we did. And uh, I said to Boyan, he, he was my, my student and later my, my assistant, I told him, look, the actor that I was playing with, he was afraid of flying. So he didn't want to go to Canada. <laughs> And I said to Boyan, look, I will put you in the show. You'll get your chance as an actor, but you will have to stay in Canada and all the money that we earn, you will have to spend it to uh, learn how to play curling. And he said, cur what? <laughs> I said, curling. Don't bother. I'll teach you everything. I don't know anything about curling. Uh, I never stepped on ice, but we'll stay there, use our money that we earn and stay there. And we stayed for nine days, learned 10 days and practiced and then went to the Europeans and um, and uh, actually won two games at the Europeans, which was uh, <laughs> extraordinary. Um, and later we did, uh, Boyan and I did that uh, comedy part on, uh, for, on YouTube. Uh, and with the guy, the, the third person is actually an American YouTuber of Serbian origins. Uh -uh. And actually, uh, the, actually, from him, I learned that you have to do YouTube as your daily uh, full-time job <laughs> if you want to succeed. Because I opened my channel in 2006, and I still have like 400 or maybe 500 followers, and that's it. Uh, because I didn't do it on a regular basis. I mm -hmm. put a video then for six months, nothing. And then maybe later on another video. And I mean, just when I feel like it and when I have something to put on, I, I never treated YouTube as a full-time job. And, and from him, I actually learned that it is a full-time job. So <laughs> I decided not to do it. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um... When you were doing the rapid fire, the verbal section was a lot of sounds. It wasn't yeah. necessarily words. And so that I always thought that sound is a gesture and gesture is a sound. So it's interesting, you know, we've been talking about communication and mind, but even though you were using sound and some words, it, they were still gestures. And then again, yeah. you know, and then again, the, the movements became sound, you know, the movement became a voice. Yeah. So that's that's an interesting because brain this, that operates I'm, like that that's communication yeah i i'm i'm full into genre this is mime radio so i had to do mime for radio no no it's <laughs> it makes perfect sense i'm totally a fan of that and and, and appreciate that um so well, go ahead I, english is not not my my mother tongue so i'm not really you know it's it's kind of difficult to to do the as, as, so verbal associations and it was easier for me to do the yeah like laser laser leaf uh, was that a real question or were you just that, that was the question what what is laser leaf well you know we it's a know. it's a <laughs> zing, zing, zing. Uh, <laughs> it's a laser you know laser and a leaf <laughs> see it makes sense to james it makes sense to me <laughs> but I do that. I do want to say that your English is much better than our Serbian, although you did teach us to say dobra juto. Yes, sir. Which is good morning, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So of all of the places you've gone in the world for your work, uh, Marco, what's your favorite place? Ooh. Uh hmm. 
Uh, um, yeah, interesting question. I really had good time and I really love that city. I, I, uh, it's Edinburgh. I love Edinburgh. Yeah. And during, during the festival, the, it, there is everything is theater there. Even in Avignon, it's the same thing because you have during one month, you have like 15,000 performances of, of different shows. Uh, and uh, everybody's an actor, everybody. So people go in and out of pubs, uh, uh, theaters, um, garages. So you, you have shows everywhere. Ah, that uh, sounds wonderful. Oh, it's, it's, I, I love it. I really love it. So as for a long, long time, I, even I lived in Paris for three years. Edinburgh was for me probably one of the most beautiful cities. I, I loved it better than... than um, than uh, than Paris. I mean, Paris uh, is nice. Do you, so do you have any have... disaster stories? Any disaster stories during these trips of touring or any uh, being a comedian? Is there any kind of interesting story that might have happened to you in yeah. the flesh? Uh, in these wherever, I, yeah, wherever I go, uh, for whatever reason, uh, I mean, theatrical reasons, if I go to teach, I did master classes at different universities. Uh, in Stockholm, in Sofia, Bulgaria, in Tbilisi, in, in uh, Shanghai, etc. Uh, uh, wherever I go, I always tell to people that organize that those events. I tell them, look, uh, if you have, I mean, this is kind of my um, personal mission. Uh, not really a mission because that that's. That, that would mean that I think of myself too high and, and I don't. Uh, um, uh, I, I like working with children, uh, with deaf children. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I started doing that in 1996 or so. And I do that from time to time, not on a regular basis, but it, it depends when I have time or not. And, and I usually do that with, with, in schools for, for, for the deaf. And um, I, I offer to people, I said, okay, I'm coming to do the show or to do a class or and to get paid for it. And, but they usually say, okay, if you have some deaf children and if you can organize it, I'd like to do a free class of mine or a whole seminar or a workshop of mine with deaf children. I mean, I'm there, uh, I do classes a couple of hours per day or, or a show in the evening. So I have time and I want to do it. And it's part of sharing. And mm -hmm. arts in general are about sharing, especially performing arts. You give. You don't ask anything in return. You give. Maybe you'll get back some, some uh, applause or maybe even get paid at some point. But <laughs> give and you don't ask for anything. So I say, OK, can you organize that? And, and I did the same thing in Tbilisi in 2015, 16, 17. I don't know. Uh, I told them the same thing and they say, okay, no problem. We'll try to arrange something. And just two days before I went there, they called me and they asked me, look, children are on holidays uh, <laughs> at the moment, but would you do a workshop in women's prison? Oh. Ah, I said, sure, why not? So Look, I mean, Georgia is not, I mean, it's Eastern Europe, but it's not really close to Serbia. And it's not somewhere where you would plan to go as a tourist. It's a wonderful country, beautiful country, and everybody should see it, but it's a small country. And I mean, we go to Greece during summer holidays or to Egypt or, or you know, seacoast, Turkey or somewhere. You don't plan to go to Georgia. So I went to Georgia. <laughs> and I never thought in my, in my entire professional life, especially when I was 16 and enrolled at the university, that I would be going at some point of my career to Georgia, to a women's prison, to teach mime to women who killed their husbands. So, my. So I uh, <laughs> never thought of that. So you really never know where mime will <laughs> will take you in did your you, career. Did, did it turn out okay? No, it was wonderful. I, I did a workshop. They were great. We did it in a... Uh, I went through all the security part of the prison. We did it in a, in a library. 
But after that, I couldn't, we would, I, I did a workshop for like three or four hours. But after that, I couldn't speak for another three or four hours also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hard. Wow. It was I mean, a hard experience. Oh, yeah. I mean, they were great, very happy, et cetera, et cetera. But you can feel certain energy. And it, it was emotional. It was, it was quite disturbing. I mean, it, wasn't, it wasn't really a disaster story. It was more of a, no, 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 of it's a, not a cathartic uh, revelation of, yeah, an aspect of the world that you hadn't experienced before. Yeah, well, the, 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 it was like a it was like a hurricane came or a tornado, you know, in terms oh, yeah, of disasters, yeah. you know, and yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, if what you want disasters, I was uh, in 2014. We had really bad floods in in Serbia, really bad floods, and um, uh, at that time. I was not, I, I was abroad somewhere for a couple of days. I came back and uh, I, I knew that we had to do something. I was at that time general manager of Belgrade Youth Center, which is a very big cultural center with cinema, theater and uh, concert halls in the center of Belgrade. And uh, in a couple of days, we organized the biggest rock and roll concert uh, humanitarian rock and roll concert, uh, charity concert in, in, that, uh, in, in, our, in, in that space. And uh, we waited for like 10 days, 15 days because some people died. We didn't want to go immediately with, with music and fun, but we did that with Serbian Red Cross. And, and for instance, that if it has nothing to do with mime, it has to do with art and, and performing arts and rock and roll. <laughs> but that was that was great. But another disaster that I will remember all my life, personal disaster, is my diploma work. I did La Moschetta, The Midge, uh, by Ruzzante. It's Commedia dell'arte. And uh, fortunately, in Commedia dell'arte, you can improvise because I didn't learn my text well <laughs> for my diploma work. Oh, <laughs> Uh, very unusual, uh, and uh, and that was I had diarrhea. That was the first and last time before I went on stage. Sorry about that. But <laughs> later on, I also had diarrhea when I was directing, but never when I was acting. Oh dear. Oh good. Let's change the subject. Let's talk about <laughs> legacy. This is important. No, yeah. sorry. This is important. Okay. This is important because that's how I learned that. Directors, the most important thing for a director that, that, uh, to learn is that at certain point, the show that he or she is directing stops being their show and it becomes the show of actors on stage. Mm -hmm. So like 10 days or a week before the opening, they, you don't need a director anymore because it's, sorry, my dogs are barking. So, it, it stops being the show of the director and it becomes the show of actors. So he shouldn't, he, I, I, when I was, when I direct, so for the last week or so uh, before the opening, I don't even come to rehearsals. I do the technical stuff, the lights, et cetera, et cetera, but I don't work with actors anymore. It's their show. It's not mine anymore. So, uh, and that's very, very, a very difficult thing to learn. What, what about your legacy? Like, um, how do you want your energy to continue? Or, or is that it, it, it interesting to you at all? Or is something that you're, you think about? The Marco's legacy. Well, I do think I'm 50, so uh, half a century. So I, I started thinking about that. And um, uh, I do think about it very often. Um, I stopped doing institutional acting uh, and shows on a regular basis like seven or eight years ago because we had a flood of reality shows on our television and the quality of, of screenplays really went down. Now it's coming up and there's an explosion of, of, of TV production here in Serbia. And uh, we have quite a few of co-productions also, uh, foreign productions coming to Serbia to film. 
I did, for instance, like, I don't know, a few years ago, a film Coriolanus with uh, with Ray Fiennes mm. and Gerard Butler. Ah, small role, but nevertheless. Uh, because our government is now giving incentives to, to foreign productions and to co-productions, so that, that's good. Uh, but I'm not really that much involved in theater anymore and in and, and, and production here. Um, I was more turned to teaching and to, to charity work. I did a lot of charity work in past 10 years. Um, um, uh, but now I started thinking going back on stage. I did a show. Uh, it's called Still Awaiting Heaven. Uh, it's actually, it was Awaiting Heaven a show that I did 25 years ago. It's a mime, mm. uh, non-verbal show, physical theater. Mm -hmm. a, a love story between a Serbian peasant and a classical ballerina. I thought, you know, I watched that and I felt there was cultural elements that there was, that yeah. you were studying in depth um, some social movements and so, uh, cultural aspects of Serbian yes. experience. Yes. You know, I felt there was a, there were several levels playing on that. Oh yes, in yes. That production, you know, yeah. Yes, especially, especially, it's a show that we did 25 years ago. So that means in 90s, during the wars that we have and the crisis, financial, huge financial crisis that we had, and um, a cultural crisis, and um, um, the crisis of social values, because that the, that was the time where. Uh, 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 criminals were most popular, and and uh, and uh, starlets, or how do you call them? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, nowadays it's becoming a reality show star, mm -hmm. reality reality personality, reality. That's something I found in Western media. Reality. I guess Celebr celebrities uh, yeah. from reality shows. Not so it. You don't have to have any kind of school or any kind yeah, of- Yeah, it's just who you are, yeah, yeah. You just go have sex in front of cameras with everybody and, and fight with each other and you become a star. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, yeah. So do you see your, your legacy as being a performer or a teacher or the organizer of, of communication amongst uh, mimes? Well, probably that third thing, you know, organizer of communication or, or getting, having, getting people together, bringing people. Yeah, together. yeah it's a beautiful, yeah. that's a, a very valuable and beautiful thing. What, well, what kind of advice would you give to young artists, specifically young artists that are interested in, in performing as mimes or, or, or discovering physical theater? Go, uh, go to a proper school, learn what you can during year, two years, three years, four years, and then, uh, and then uh, go back, go out and to the world and find your way. And never treat your audience, uh, always treat your audience with respect yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and love. Never, uh, it doesn't matter who is in your audience. I, I know I have colleagues here also who say, ah, oh, I'm going to that city. And, Ah, we played the show, but it was for uh, you know uh, right. working class. And, uh, how do you call them? Uh, working class, yeah, yeah. Blue collar. We say blue uh, collar sometimes. Uh, I I never did that. For me, an audience is an audience. And a few days ago, when I received that uh, golden badge, they asked. Uh, there, there was a few of us on stage. They asked us to do a little something, and. Uh, uh, there uh, another um, uh, a, a wonderful uh, uh, violin player and another accordion player, but uh, our that play our uh, folk music. Uh, they also received uh, two of them received the golden badge, and uh, I did like a paraphrase of um, a citation of um, Marcel Marceau's uh, piece on on, on life. You know, starting from a, a baby, a child, and dying at the end. Seven and, Ages of Man, that piece. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I did that in like two minutes or so, or three minutes. And uh, the the two guys that were in our national costumes, you know, you see that that they are that, that they are self-taught musicians, and that they are really in 
deeply into our our national music when they when ever the ceremony was finished they came out and they, they said ah you you did the whole life in three minutes so they understood and for me that was the probably the greatest award that that i i received out nice. after during, that connection I'm, I'm i'm glad you, you mentioned the the figure behind you i was going to ask you if that's who you want to be when you grow up or it's deeper than that but here's here's the question <laughs> Who do you want? What do you want to be when you grow up, Marco? This is, who do I want to be when I grow up? When you up? grow up, yeah. Um, uh, so I just like to be an actor on stage and in front of camera. I like camera. I like movies, especially with, in my age. Um, it's a one-time effort. You don't have to go you know, <laughs> for months and months and do the same thing over and over again you do it once <laughs> well wait till you get to be my age then we'll see what you're thinking you know? Mar marco it's been a wonderful conversation thank you so much thank for joining us yeah on it's the Lime radio show thank you very much marco that was really a thoughtful and a very enjoyable experience for us yeah, that's thanks. it ladies and gentlemen mime radio with marco stojanovich and goodbye <laughs> This has just arrived. Today is November 23rd and it was posted on September 28th. So Serbia and the United States are really far away. Yeah, two different continents. So this was posted in Chicago and I'm in Belgrade. And Belgrade and Chicago are sister cities. Yes, if you didn't know, this, they say that the second largest Serbian community lives after Serbia, after Belgrade, lives in Chicago. So Belgrade and, and Chicago are officially sister cities. Let me see, what is this? Mm. Mm. The Mime Museum. Uh, souvenir description, Marcus Stanis brought this Mime microphone. Oh, when he began his duties as founder and, and president of the World Mime Organization, he thought He'd need a microphone for important speeches, but as it turned out, words were not needed. Thank you for joining us on the Mime Radio Show. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> ah, cool. Uh, ready, ready. Slide microphone out carefully. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How to slide microphone out carefully? How can I do that? Mm -hmm. Slide microphone out carefully. I am trying to do that, but it's not. Hmm, it's not sliding out. Thank you.